Professor Mora, thank you for accepting our invitation for this interview. It's a privilege to interview a person who has played a key role in cardiac electrophysiology research over the past decades. How impulses are generated in the heart has long been a mystery, but how one becomes a researcher is equally an interesting question. What was the motivation for you to become a researcher? Uh, I like secrets. And I wanted to discover what was the secrets of how the heart works. <laughs> like real secrets. Yes, uh, real, real secrets, yes. And, uh, um, and, and you know, the um, one never knows um, when one starts a career as a student uh, what... Uh, uh, what the future holds. So all you can do is um, uh, do your best and search for truth. And science is the only um, truth I know that really you can look for truth uh, not some kind of made-up stuff by the uh, uh, public or made up by popular press or made up by political um, expediency. So um, I was fascinated by scientific truth. And um, that's how I started. One of the reasons why, uh, for my previous question uh, was that your career is not a typical one. Did you find it difficult to work in so many different cultural environments? No. Um, uh, I was... Uh, you know, when people ask me where am I from, I say I'm from an, an international person. Uh, I identify with the Europeans, I identify with the Americans, I don't identify that much anymore from where I was born, but I am still very proud Persian. So, uh, but above all, I'm a human being and I recognize that the humanity is the one common aspect of all nations. And we have a lot in common. And uh, very little to separate us except uh, our own, really, prejudices. What were some of the skills that you were able to take from your colleagues of different nationalities as a researcher and utilize in your own work? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Um, I was trained in New York, and I took uh, that expertise that I had in uh, New York to Heidelberg, Germany. And um, although I had advice from my mentors and my professors there, uh, I, I kept that dominant effect, what I had learned in New York, and added to it what I had in Germany. Then I took the German-American stuff and took it to Los Angeles and applied it there as an independent investigator there. And... Um, uh, as it turned out, that discovery at the time was known as a voltage clamping of cardiac muscle was very unique. I was the only one that was doing it. And so it got the attention of Nobel laureate like Sir Andrew Huxley. And uh, he started uh, his friendship uh, with me. Uh, uh, I was maybe in my uh, late 20s, early 30s, and he was, had already won the Nobel Prize. So I was very honored by this. And um, he encouraged me to continue 
what I was doing, which was very different <laughs> than anybody else. So, uh, you know, that's how it started. Based on your previous answer, it's clear that uh, different supervisors had major influence on your career. Yes. Who were the key persons in this? Yeah, I think um, if I look back to my career as a scientist, um, I think that uh, Sir Andrew Hux Huxley was um, the most influential because he encouraged me to carry out what I was doing with respect to the evolution of what we call then excitation contraction coupling. I had these observations that suggested that even signaling pathways that are very critical for function of the heart, uh, they had an evolutionary path. And um, so I think he got very excited because his grandfather, Sir uh, Thomas Huxley, who was the president of the Royal Society and was known as the Darwin's dog, right? He went around uh, essentially preaching evolution. Um, so he was very excited by this idea that I had data, I had evidence that um, one of the most significant uh, pathways in cardiac contraction and, and function of the heart goes, had an evolutionary path. Um, so what I discovered, I was working on a frog heart, it had totally different um, regulation than uh, the cat heart or the dog heart or a human heart. And what was very strange is if I looked at uh, neonatal or, you know, prenatal human heart, it acted like a frog heart, not like a human heart. So it had an evolutionary path. And I think, you know, he encouraged me, you know, at that time, uh, you know, I was 27, 28, and... Um, just starting my career in science uh, and, you know, struggling. And so um, nobody was interested in that idea, right? Uh, so, but Sir Andrew was interested and he decided that, you know, he would want to spend some time with me. <laughs> he would come to Philadelphia and be my guest and stay at my home. And so we became friends, even though he was uh, the, the great man of science. And uh, so that had tremendous, it gave me personal confidence, right? I didn't care what the other guys thought, right? The su supporting environment. Yes, yes, he was, he was tremendous. And then, you know, every, whether I was at UCLA or in Heidelberg, or even in New York, I had uh, um, an independent lab, really independent. I didn't really have classical mentors, but uh, there were scientists, uh, Bob Fritschgott, who also won the Nobel Prize for nitric oxide, happened to be the chairman of pharmacology in New York, um, that uh, would work very late. And then since I was working at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, he would stop by and talk to me for an hour or two before he went home. And so they had, uh, this really gave me confidence in myself, in my own idea. And I've been like that uh, since then. And then when I had my own lab and my own professorship, uh, my students 
had tremendous uh, influence on me, right? Because I picked students that were smarter than me. I, I really believe in this, that you, as a scientist, if you want to be successful, you pick students that are smarter than you, because then what you teach them, they can really do things with it. And all of my students that I trained, I've trained some hundred students, um, some 11 or 12 of them have become big professors, much more famous and much more successful than I have been. You know, members of National Academy and, you know, chairs of cardiology and physiology. So that formula worked for me. And the, what, what is your opinion about the early mentoring? What happens here at the National Academy of Scientist Education? Is it useful? I think so. I, I am very encouraged by this. Uh, I, I really, uh, I am impressed by the students I met and the whole training they're having so early in their career. Uh, I, uh, I don't know whether you heard my talk. I said one thing I did learn is to go back and come back to be in that uh, school trained that you know, I wasn't trained like that. I was, you know, more into politics, history, and all that stuff. I had very little scientific background. And if I had that scientific background these kids had, I would have done a great deal of things. So the future looks good, right? They are lucky. They're very lucky. Yeah. They're very, very lucky. And they don't know how lucky they are. Coming back to science, you and your colleagues pioneered the use of stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes yes. uh, in research. One of the goals of this research is to create pacemakers yes. based on genetically modified cells, yes. which could be a huge break breakthrough in the treatment of arrhythmias. Yes. What stage is this research at? Okay. What are the main difficulties that need to be overcome to make this method uh, that can be applied in human medicine? Well, one of the reasons I moved from Washington, where I was a professor and a chair there in, in uh, Georgetown University, was that I could work on stem cells. And the stem cells became very important because uh, this Professor Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize, discovered what is the difference between stem cells and regular cells. And it turned out there were four genes that were different. And if you introduce those four genes in any cells in your body, in the adult cells, you would turn them into, you'd make the cell go backward into become stem cell. That's when the light hit me. And I said, well, you know, I can make heart cells out of this. So we were one of the first groups that we take these fibroblasts, stem cells and we turn them into heart cells. So skin cells from my own skin uh, have turned them into heart cells. Now, then, you know, people were trying to put stem cells in the heart and to, uh, to regenerate the heart that was damaged and all this stuff. And none of that worked, really. It worked because we don't know enough about stem cells, about cardiac myocytes that are coming out of stem cells. So I thought an easier path is to make a pacemaker. A pacemaker is really idiotically simple concept. It's an oscillator, an electrical oscillator. So you don't really have to have a functional cell. You don't have to have a system where the, it has to work, the heart has to work, has to beat, you know. No, it just has to generate an electrical signal. So um, we generated these heart cells from stem cells, and then uh, we introduced in them the genes that are in our own sinoatrial node that's our own pacemaker. And so they worked very well. So now we are at the stage where we need to put these stem cells or these 
SA nodes or these sinoatrial nodal cells that pace into animals. Now, that is a, a major issue, right? Because you have to make sure that these cells uh, a month later don't die. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to make sure that they will survive. Of course, because we take the skin cell from the patient in which we're going to put them in, they will not be rejected. But you want to be sure that they don't get modified. And now, my concept is that if we put a, such an embryonic, such a uh, young pacemaker in the heart, that heart is going to rejuvenate by itself. Because, you know, a lot of the diseases that you think are uh, brain diseases or other cardiovascular diseases, they're really because the heart isn't working the way it works in that young man or that young lady in their 20s and 30s and instead of working in a 70, 80-year-old man, right? So if you can rejuvenate the heart by having the pacemaker being a real pacer instead of some electronic system that you zap the heart with electrically every five seconds or 10 seconds or a minute, then you actually may rejuvenate the whole body. And instead of you living uh, to be 80 years old or 90 years old, you may live to be 120, 130 years old, but like a young man, right? It won't, the system will not degenerate. So there is a lot to learn about this area. And I hope that my students will push this idea because I probably will uh, not be around to push it. Or maybe some students from this academy. Yes, yes, that's as I told them, right? As I told them, uh, the theories we have are interesting. It's for them to show whether this works or not. Thank you. It was an honor to speak with you. Thank you. I'm happy to, to welcome you in Hungary, and I hope that you will return very soon. Thank you. I hope so, too. Thank you so much.